Remember Disney Channel Summers? As a child, nothing was more exciting than seeing those commercials with the actors saying, It's Disney Channel Summer! And they start showing what exciting things will be coming out that summer. Movies, specials, and new episodes of every show on the channel. In 2013, I was excited for Disney Channel Summer because I was sure that Gravity Falls would be airing over the summer. And I was waiting for more episodes after a long, grueling... two-month wait? I remember it being a lot longer. I have no idea how I survived the break between seasons that happened right after that summer that ended up being one day short of a full year. But Gravity Falls wasn't Disney Channel's only show to completely take place over only one summer. Wow. If I had a nickel for- Phineas and Ferb always had summer-themed special events. In 2010, we got Summer Belongs to You. In 2011, we got the movie Across the Second Dimension. And in 2012, we got the special two-parter Where's Perry, which all came out pretty close to the end of summer for some reason. Where's Perry was basically like a 44 minute TV movie. Except you had to wait almost a month between the first and second part. During the summer of 2012, I was so excited for this. And after part one aired, I was even more excited for part two. And then after waiting a month, part two finally aired. I was disappointed. Part one sets up so many plot points. And ends on a gigantic triple cliffhanger. And none of them get satisfying resolutions. The basic synopsis of part one is that the Flynn Fletcher family and Phineas and Ferb's friends all go to Africa. Meanwhile, Perry has to stay home due to urgent matters that end up not being urgent, but then become urgent. Candace spends the whole trip trying to find a phone to call Jeremy because he didn't come to the airport before she left like he said he would. Phineas and Ferb build a highly unconventional vehicle using different animal attributes to get to the bottom of a gourd that it's apparently impossible to get to the bottom of without a highly unconventional vehicle. Doofenshmirtz accidentally turns Carl evil trying to make Major Monogram evil. Carl plans to use OWCA's computer to take over the tri-state area. He captures Major Monogram Perry and Doofenshmirtz Doofenshmirtz. However, Doofenshmirtz ends up helping Carl as his unpaid intern. Now, after all this, we get to the last few minutes of this episode. This is an ending that gets you excited for the next episode. We get rapid fire cliffhanger after cliffhanger. In these last few minutes, Perry locks Carl out of the OWCA computer. So Carl needs Perry's paw print to get back into the computer. Candace gets on the phone with Jeremy and he breaks up with her. Phineas, Ferb, and all their friends all fall down a gorge. And minutes before that fall, Phineas says, Of course, any other path down would mean instant death. So this fall means instant death for all of them. And finally, Doofenshmirtz turns on all his innators at once. Perry gets hit by all of them and disappears. There's no way to know what hit him and what happened to him. And again, Carl needs him to get into the OWCA computer. Now, overall, this episode is fine. My biggest problem with it is that because it's a part one, in every storyline aside from the Perry one, it feels like there's a lack of things happening, especially for a 22 minute episode. And some parts of the episode, like the safari song, just feel like they're stretching out the episode. Especially because the episode already has two other songs that are at least more important to the story. Because what does this whole safari part even accomplish? But telling a super exciting story wasn't this episode's goal. Its goal was to have a big cliffhanger that'll get the viewers excited to come back for part two. And I feel the episode successfully did that. I was very excited for part two. However, the goal of part two should be, and seems to be, to give an exciting and satisfying conclusion to everything set up in part one, which I unfortunately do not think this episode achieved. I think to properly show how disappointing this episode is, I should go over the episode scene by scene, because I feel that'll be the best way to show all the constant big and small plot contrivances and other disappointing ways this episode concludes the last episode's cliffhangers. So this episode begins with following up on the Perry story. Carl wants to know which innator hit Perry so he can find him. He rules out all but one. Some of the innators are ruled out with reasons like it missed Perry. Okay, sure. I know it's a small issue to point out, but 
The fact that this happens, and we're not even two minutes into the episode, says a lot. Because we already have a continuity error in the episode this early on. But it turns out Perry was hit with the go hominator. So Carl flies to Phineas and Ferb's house to find Perry. Then we cut to Candace, who after thinking Jeremy broke up with her, decides to leave society. Which... Sounds like a strange decision, but it fits her character. I don't have a problem with this scene specifically, but it does bring up a problem I have with the last episode. Watch this and tell me if you can figure out what the big twist here is. Candace, what I think. I thought we should break up. What? Even when I first watched this as a nine-year-old, I was able to figure it out. So I don't think this twist later, where it turns out he wasn't breaking up with her, was super shocking. And maybe that's not the idea. Because when we find out that isn't what he meant, it's not really treated like a twist. But if they didn't mean for it to be a twist, why did they end the first episode with that as one of their big cliffhangers? So either it's a cliffhanger with an easy to guess twist, or if you're supposed to be able to figure out the twist, it's not really much of a cliffhanger. We then move on to Phineas and Ferb's story, and right from the start, I cannot tell you how disappointing it was, even as a child, to have the story start immediately with them holding on to these vines, which weren't even there in the last episode, and are higher up than how far we saw them fall at the end of part one. And watching this, how was them grabbing onto those vines even possible in any way at all? Not only do they fall further down than the bottom of these vines, they also fall pretty far from the edge of the cliff at the end of part one and the vines are right by the cliff they would have had to jump so high and so far to be grabbing onto these vines also look at this how do they even jump out of this machine with how it's falling the metal is above their heads and behind their backs so they would have had to jump to a cliff in front of them and couldn't have jumped to the one behind them unless these five children were somehow all able to break through this giant metal machine on top of that, the cliff itself just looks entirely different between episodes. So, I guess you could say it's a different cliff? But first of all, the cliff at the beginning of part 2 has to at least be around the first cliff as their machine is down there. Also, that doesn't match up with this shot from the last episode, because the only one that it looks like they could have jumped to is way too small. So. Is it this? Is this what we see of the cliff they grab onto? Also, if they grabbed onto a different cliff, you have to actually say or show that in some way. But going on, Phineas is staring at the remains of their machine and sees Perry, or does he? Guess we'll have to find out. But anyway, they almost die, and luckily we get some decent action, where Phineas saves all of them with a vine. It's a decent action scene. Then, apparently, even though they fell down this Death Gorge, after one action scene, the only other thing they need to do to get to the bottom is basically a mild hike walking down some rocks. Because in the next scene with them, they're just casually walking on the ground. Phineas says that he saw Perry, and then we see Carl and his robot search for Perry in his house. Candace Robot sees pictures of Jeremy, and I guess that makes her not evil for a bit, and Carl finds out that Perry isn't in Phineas and Ferb's house. Back in Africa, Phineas says that he's sure it's Perry and they need to find him. And we see that Perry is actually in Africa. Carl calls him, and I guess we didn't know about Carl's part-time career as a botanist, as he recognizes the flowers behind Perry as one of a kind immediately. He looks up where they're from and finds out they need to go to Africa. We cut to Doofenshmirtz and Major Monogram, and Doofenshmirtz decides to help him and unlocks Major Monogram with this key that he just has. He was never given this at any point in either episode. You couldn't have just added a scene of Carl handing Doof Entrance the key before leaving, because at that point he still thinks Doof wants to help him. There wouldn't have been any reason for Carl to give him the key and not just take it with him, but that still would have been better than this. Or just have Carl forget the key. That would have been a bit of a lazy way to get Monogram out of the cell. But it still would have been way better than Doof Entrance just randomly pulling this key out of his ass. No one asks why he has it, we never see how he got it, it just comes out of nowhere. So Doof and Major Monogram follow Carl to Africa. 
Then we get Candace's song about how she's leaving society to live with monkeys. I don't really have any problems with this scene. The song is pretty good and given the circumstances combined with her personality, it's not too crazy that Candace would do this. Phineas is still searching for Perry and seems very uncertain about everything he's saying, aside from the fact that Perry is there somewhere. His friend suggests the idea of heading back, but Phineas refuses, and they agree to continue to help him after he gives a speech. They see Perry's footprints and begin to follow them. However, Buford says this, You know, that could be just a duck! Which, from all the characters' perspectives, including Phineas, would be a lot more plausible than that being Perry. Because it's only his footprints, no paw prints, and anytime Phineas sees Perry, he walks around on all fours. So from the perspective of Phineas and all his friends who have never seen Perry standing on two legs, why would they only see his footprints? We get a few quick scenes of Perry being surrounded by other animals, Carl landing his ship and telling his robots to search for Perry, Doofenshmirtz and Monogram flying together while Doof is building a re goodinator to change Carl back, and has to use parts of the ship to do so, and Phineas and his friends looking for Perry while Carl is watching. We then see Candace Robot meeting real Candace, and the robot stops being evil once again. We get a few quick scenes which just amount to another quick looking for Perry scene and another quick doof building scene. Then back to the Phineas and Ferb plotline. They all see Perry across a river and try to walk on this log to get to the other side. Then Carl gets one of his robots to shoot the log and that causes them to all fall in the river. Carl then confronts Perry with a bunch of robots. But it turns out all the animals we saw earlier are now OWCA agents. So Carl and Perry both have armies. We get some more pretty good action scenes of the animals fighting the robots and Phineas and everyone else going down the river, ending with them getting launched into quicksand. Doof and Monogram crash where Carl and Perry are fighting, and Major Monogram uses the robots to give Doof parts to finish his machine. Again, these action scenes aren't bad. Then Candace Robot sacrifices herself for Candace because of Jeremy? Wait, Jeremy didn't break up with me? Call him. Which is one of the very cheesy ways this episode ends a story. Because suddenly this robot and only this one, all the other ones have no problems with killing people because none of the other ones are shown to have emotions. But this one sacrifices itself because it cares so much about Candace's relationship? This feels like the scene in Meepless in Seattle, where Balloonie dies, but that was more comedic and wasn't meant to be taken completely serious like this moment was. Candace finds out Jeremy didn't break up with her and is given a phone and talks to him. Back in Phineas and Ferb's story, Buford is the only one who hasn't fallen into quicksand, so he uses a vine to pull them out. Doofenshmirtz finishes the re goodinator but can't move it, so he needs Carl to be exactly in the right spot. So Perry decides to lead Carl up there because Carl wants his paw print. Carl is getting close to being in range but realizes what Perry's doing and moves away. Perry tells Doof to shoot anyway, so he does and Perry uses a picture frame to reflect the ray and get it to hit Carl? Which is a very weak way to conclude this. I get that Perry having the picture relates to the whole family aspect of this story, but also, the picture frame comes out of nowhere. Like, if earlier in one of the scenes Perry is all sad and he's looking at the picture, that would have made sense. Oh wait, he does, in part one, while he's at home, and there's no indication that he's taking it with him. This would have made more sense if when Monogram called him, instead of us just seeing Perry putting the picture on the floor, he saw him put it behind his back like he does with his hat, so we know he still has it. Another way you could have fixed this is that there was a scene in Africa earlier where Perry sees Phineas looking for him in the distance and watches looking sad, which would have been a great time to have him take out the picture and just sadly look at it for a second. So we know Perry has it with him while he's in Africa and him pulling it out and using it would be more rewarding and make more sense. Including both of these would have been best, but at least one would have been a good way to actually show that Perry has that frame with him. <coughs> After Carl is turned back to being good, him and Major Monogram reconcile. Major Monogram, Doofenshmirtz, and Carl all go back to Danville and pick up all the debris and Phineas and Ferb's invention from the first part as they're leaving. 
Carl asks why Perry ended up in Africa, even though he's sure the go hominator is what hit him, and Major Monogram explains it's because his family is in Africa, and home is where the heart is. Wow, isn't that just lovely? I'm sorry, but this is such a dumb twist. Why would Doof program an emotional message into his innator? Usually they just do what the title says, so it should have just sent Perry to his home. This is also just a cheesy ending overall. The fact that they have this big cliffhanger and mystery, and the resolution we had to wait a month for ended up just being a cheesy moral is so disappointing. Cheesy morals and endings like this are things that the show has made fun of in the past. I want to get back to that in a minute, but first I'll just quickly recap the rest of the episode. Phineas finds Perry, Candace finds all of them and uses her animal communication to have elephants bring them back to their campsite. The characters all sit around the campfire, there are a few wrap ups to some things that you could maybe call subplots, but they were so small I didn't even bother mentioning them. Then Candace asks if anyone else thinks the fact that Perry somehow came all the way to Africa is weird. No one else cares the end. But back to what I was saying earlier, that the twist of this episode is something the show has made fun of before, as well as the fact that the dramatic death of Candace Robot is also something the show has made fun of before. That emphasizes a big problem I have with this episode, that being that it doesn't feel like Phineas and Ferb. I had a vivid memory of after Major Monogram explaining why Perry ended up in Africa, Carl says something like, That's a little cheesy, sir, don't you think? And I think a reason I thought he said that was because it doesn't feel like this show to do something so dumb and cheesy and not call it out. The episode has so many big and small plot contrivances too, and I'm aware that some of the ones I pointed out were small. but. All the big disappointing aspects, like how Phineas and Ferb's story in part 2 just begins with them hanging on to some vines that weren't there before, and we don't see any plausible way that they could have grabbed onto them, and how cheesy the resolution to the Perry cliffhanger is, and that stupid moment of Doof having the key out of nowhere, combined with the countless small shortcuts and plot contrivances this story takes on top of the already mentioned facts that they do stuff that the show has made fun of, and the fact that there's a lot of fluff in part 1, shows a lack of effort, another thing that just doesn't feel like this show, which makes it feel like this is something that the writers didn't really want to do. It feels like this is something that Disney Channel told them to do and then they were like, fine. I feel like if they changed some aspects, like the disappointing twist, this two-parter would have been better as one TV movie, because then they could cut out some of the fluff of the part one half and given more attention and time to things like how Phineas and Ferb even got out of their giant machine to begin with. Because I feel like one of the big problems with this episode is that they need the big moment where everything goes wrong to be right in the middle. So the setup for all these elements comes later than it should, and the payoff and resolutions for all these plot lines doesn't get as much time as it needs. This episode has a few good aspects, like decent action and some good jokes. I'll be impressed when we don't plummet to earth on fire. Oh, stop panicking, Francis. I haven't even touched the main stabilizers. You know, yet. But overall, the episode is so disappointing with its cheesy wrap-up to the Perry story. It's Phineas Story's main cliffhanger of them falling being wrapped up in a few minutes and beginning in a contrived way that makes no sense when watching the end of the last episode, and the fact that the Candace Story's twist, if you want to call it that, is very easy to guess. Overall, this episode is disappointing on all fronts, and really didn't give a satisfying conclusion to anything. I never liked this episode. It disappointed me as a child, and it disappointed me now. Wait. If I had a nickel for every time-